Hello and welcome back to the Cost of Living series, where I measure the power draw of all of my consoles so we can try and eliminate phantom power and save a few pennies. Now this is all of course in the wake of the cost of electricity rising by about 21% at the beginning of October, which has led us all to try and save as much as possible. So far, I've covered all of the consoles that I have from the second generation all the way up to the seventh. And today, I'll be checking out generations eight and nine. So, hello fellow gamers. And I think it's about time we covered these. All right, so let's check out the last of all of the consoles I have set up and see what their real life power drawer is. I'll be measuring each of the consoles in their on and in use state in standby and off, whatever's available for the system. And I'll be measuring everything in kilowatt hours so we can easily work out an estimated cost. If you're new to the series, I'd recommend checking it out from the very beginning. I mean, you don't have to, of course, unless you own the consoles featured in those videos, but it'll at least provide a bit of context. Now, context is good because we're about to see a lot of surprising results from the last couple of generations. I've taken the liberty of putting a playlist in the corner there if you want to start from the beginning. So without further ado, let's get cracking. And we'll start off with perhaps the most misunderstood console of the last decade. One, two, three, Let us start off with the Wii U. Released back in late of November 2012 over here, it really confused a lot of consumers over whether it was a new system or just an add-on for the popular Wii from the previous generation. It was also the very first Nintendo system that natively supported HDMI and with it also projecting a separate video feed to the main controller, the gamepad, you could even play it at home without a telly. Either way, we want to know how much power the system is drawing, and what better way to check that than with one of its last official releases. Playing through Breath of the Wild, the Wii U drew 0.033 kilowatt hours, so you can happily enjoy this epic Zelda title for roughly a penny an hour, or if you find yourself getting lost in the vast world of post-apocalyptic Hyrule, it'll cost nearly 27 pence a day. That's excluding the cost of keeping that gamepad charged though, which is another significant draw in of itself, let's be frank. But what about when we put the little Wii U to sleep? How much electricity is it sipping away when we're not using it? Well, like its predecessor, the Wii U has two different standby options. One where it's still connected to the internet and one where it isn't indicated by orange and red LEDs respectively on the power button. Now I have to state at this point in its online orange light state, it really only stays like that when it's doing something. Something like downloading a game or a system update or any messages you might be swapping with your mates. So with that in mind, when it's active, it's drawing 0.015 kilowatt hours of power, which equates to half a pence an hour and just over 12 pence a day if it has something, you know, rather large to download and it's gonna take some time. But most of the time, it's going to be in its red LED state where it's drawing absolutely nothing from the mains. So it's fair to assume that in its always online standby mode, it's mostly gonna cost nothing and it will use its internal battery to periodically check for updates. But since there aren't really any noteworthy updates for the Wii U these days, you're better off turning off that standby mode and letting it shut itself down completely. If you do that, you've got little need to have to unplug the Wii U to save on the pennies. About a year later, we got the PlayStation TV Micro Console, a non-handheld variant of the PlayStation Vita, which itself came out over a year previous. The PSTV was praised for being a convenient way to play Vita and PSP games on the big screen, but that opinion quickly diminished when it was revealed that it could only play a fraction of the Vita's game library. That, of course, led me to soft mod my own PSTV, so I wouldn't be bound by such restrictions. But with that aside, how much does it cost to run? As it's based on a handheld system, you would hope that it wouldn't be all that much, right? Well, you would be right. When playing through Wipeout 2048, the PSTV cost me a fraction of a pence to run at just 0 0.002 kilowatt hours, and racing away the entire day would cost a measly one and three quarter pence. That gives us good hopes that the PSTV is a nice and cheap system to have while we're not even using it. And like many other systems, it has a standby mode and just plain old off. Now in standby, I measured absolutely nothing, which I found a little puzzling. 
I can only imagine it checks for updates every now and then, and, well, with it drawing very little when it's even on, that's actually pretty darn good. Naturally, of course, it measured the same whilst off as well. So do we just keep this on standby? Well, there was an update for the system not that long ago, I think it was like August or something. But the last update before that was 2019, that was over three years ago. And since I haven't seen any game updates for a very long time now, on both the PSTV and my Vita, I think there's very little benefit in keeping it on standby these days. I think in the long run, you're better off turning it off. Now we've had one PlayStation, yes, but what about second PlayStation? Or rather, the PlayStation 4 Pro. This graced the shores of, well, everywhere in 2016, three years after the original model launched. Packing a faster GPU, 4K TV support, and an extra USB port, it's certainly a nice upgrade from the original, but it also has a higher power draw than the original. So how much is it costing us after we'd splurged 350 quid for one at launch? When testing the Pro's power draw, I decided to push the system as much as I could by playing Gran Turismo 7. It's a very recent title, and when in a race, I can really hear the fan going, trying to keep all of the internals cool. And yet, this is meant to be the quieter CUH7200 model, yet it still sounds like a jet engine taken off when playing this game. So, I can only imagine it's being pushed really hard. The magic number we got out of this was 0.136 kilowatt hours. That is a staggering four and a half pence per hour. And if you did one of those 24 hour endurance races, well, <laughs> here it is. Over a quid per full day of racing. It's worth noting as well that this wasn't even running at 4K, since I only have a 1080p TV in here. If it were, chances are the power draw would have been higher. But what about its cost when we're leaving it in standby? Well, this is where things really start getting complicated. The PS4 in general may only have rest mode and off as its options, but it has so many different settings in rest mode that could affect its power draw when not in use. So I tried to measure as many as I could to try and check every box. But first, I'll show you the draw of my typical setup. I normally keep everything on except waking from Spotify, and this drew 0.006 kilowatt hours, which is about one fifth of a penny every hour. That equates to just shy of 18 quid per year simply left in that standby state. When the Pro is allowed to remain connected to the internet in rest mode, it can also continue its downloads without having to leave the system on. While leaving it downloading the Final Fantasy VII Remake in rest mode, I managed to measure a draw of 0.053 kilowatt hours. That's a little under two pence an hour and over 43 pence per day. That's worth knowing if you've got a lot of lengthy downloads to do. And it might be worth investing in an external hard drive if you have a lot of games, so that way you're only downloading them the once. I then measured the various other settings switched on and off, and I was surprised to find the difference between them didn't seem to vary all that much. This is based on an hour's measurement, of course, so we might start seeing a difference in cost when measuring for far longer periods. However, this at least tells us that rest mode costs us about £15 at a minimum per year. I also checked to see if we could have rest mode enabled, but have everything switched off. But unfortunately, the Pro doesn't let us do that. So instead, we'll see what the Pro draws when it's seemingly switched off. And the result is absolutely nothing. Which makes sense, as this is the mode Sony tells us to use before unplugging the system. If we unplug it while it's in rest mode, it throws a hissy fit at us. So what should you do regarding this one? Well, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Undoubtedly, you'll save the most by turning it off rather than leaving it in rest mode. But the PS4 is still supported by Sony right now, even two years after the PS5 released. Plenty of games are still coming out for it, system updates are still coming out, and many are opting to stick with these because it's been difficult to get a hold of a PS5. So it's gonna be down to what you need, really. You might need to let it download updates on standby. You might need to keep the USB ports powered to charge your controllers. You might even play remotely quite often, so you're gonna wanna keep that one on. But what am I gonna do? Well, I'm just gonna straight up turn it off. It's as simple as that. Personally, I find the automatic downloads in rest mode are spotty at best. I mean, there was an 11 day old update available for GT7 when I was getting set up for all of this, which it should have downloaded long ago. 
I can charge my controllers anywhere else. I don't need Wake on LAN for remote play nor for Spotify. And it may be a while between gaming sessions on it, so I don't think I'm going to need to keep my last game suspended either. And besides, if I think I'm going to need any of these options soon, like initiating a download and not wanting to leave the system on, I can just put it back in rest mode for a moment while it does that. But for the most part, I'm leaving it off. Oof, with that out of the way, let's move on to something a little easier. The Nintendo Switch, released in March of 2017, is very different to the rest of these consoles, as it can be played in handheld mode and off the mains entirely. But of course, to play it on a TV, you're going to need to keep it docked and connected to the mains power, so how much is that setting us back? Now for these measurements, I used a mixture of my launch switch and my limited edition Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee switch. Other than the outer casings, they're practically identical to each other, and both use the more power-hungry processor, unlike the switches that came after them, like the red box models. Now, like with the Wii U, I played through Breath of the Wild while measuring the power draw of an already fully charged switch, and it came out at a measly 0.01 kilowatt hours. That's only a third of a pence an hour, and just a little over eight pence a day when exploring this war-torn version of Hyrule. Now, believe it or not, that's cheaper than playing the same game on a Wii U. And the Switch version even runs at a higher resolution than the Wii U one. Now, that is impressive. Of course, though, as a system that can run off its own internal battery, we're going to need to charge it every now and then. Switched off and left to charge in the dock, the Switch drew a little more than 0.012 kilowatt hours. That's about 0.4 of a pence an hour. And with the Switch taking roughly three hours to charge from 0 to 100%, this can cost up to about 1.2 pence per full charge. Naturally, that will differ depending on how much charge was already in there. Once it's reached 100%, left in the dock and in standby, the switch draws absolutely nothing from the mains. Now, it may periodically check for updates, but given it takes so little power when in use anyway, this is unlikely to make a dent on your bills. Speaking of which, since the switch can also download games and updates while it's on standby, it was worth checking that too. I measured 0.003 kilowatt hours while leaving a fully charged switch on standby downloading a big game. That's 0.1 pence an hour and just shy of two and a half pence a day. And I've got to cover this too because I know someone's going to ask. With no switch in it, the dock costs absolutely nothing. You can happily leave it plugged in and switched on. It's the switch itself that's doing all the power management and when it's absent, the dock does bugger all. You're fine. With regards to the switch, I don't think you need to worry too much about its power draw. You can happily keep it in its dock when not in use, but if you're really concerned, you can always switch it completely off when you're done with it. It might be advisable to invest in a bigger micro SD card though if you have a lot of games, to save you from having to waste power and time re-downloading them again. And also, depending on the game, you might benefit financially by playing it in handheld mode more often. At least, certainly that way, you don't need to consider the cost of running your TV as well. It's now time for Microsoft to represent as we move over to the Xbox One X. Coming out in the latter part of 2017, this beast took everything of the original Xbox One and dialed them all the way up to 11. As you would expect, that also includes its power draw as well, especially when running 4K games optimised for the system. Now, I may only be using a 1080p TV here, but nonetheless, what draw does the Xbox One X have when running one of these optimised games? For this, I went with Fallout 76. Not only is it optimised for the One X, but it also requires a constant connection to the internet, which will make the system push that little bit harder. The end result after an hour was the highest reading we've seen so far at 0.15 kilowatt hours. That's over five pence per hour. Oh, heaven forbid if you decided to wander off to explore West Virginia's wastelands all day, because that'll set you back over £1.20. And God knows how much that is in bottle caps. With such a huge power draw when in use, that makes it all the more important that it remain cheap when it's not in use. The standby options for the One X are simpler than they are for the PS4 Pro, with only two options available besides plain old off, standby and energy saver. In standby, you can remotely connect to the One X as well as boot it up faster, whereas energy saver means no remote connections and it will take a little longer to boot up. 
but Microsoft claims the Xbox will only consume 0.5 watts in energy saver mode, which is supposedly 20 times less than regular standby mode. Well, I'll be the judge of that. Let's see what the One X is really drawing in these states. On regular old standby mode, not downloading anything, I got a reading of 0.016 kilowatt hours. That's a little over half a pence an hour, which staggeringly works out at nearly 50 quid per year. Is remote play and fast booting really worth all that? <laughs> no. And while it's downloading something, the power draw ramps up the 0.037 kilowatt hours. That's one and a quarter pence per hour and a little over 30 pence a day. In comparison, Energy Saver, again, not downloading anything, measured 0.002 kilowatt hours. That's only 0.07 pence per hour. And that would cost us a more reasonable six quid over the course of a year. This was measured again whilst downloading a system update and the result was more or less the same. Now, those of you paying attention may have noticed something slightly off with all this. Microsoft claimed half a watt of power usage when an Xbox is in energy saving mode, but I measured 0.002 kilowatt hours in that same mode, even when it wasn't doing anything. That's not half a watt, that's actually two watts, four times as much as what Microsoft is claiming. Furthermore, when I tried to confirm these half watt claims by sourcing a statement from Microsoft themselves, conveniently, they left out the One X from its help pages. They say the One S and the Series X both use half a watt, and even less for the Series S, but there's nothing for the One X. You see, this is the reason why we shouldn't take manufacturer's word as gospel. I would love to see Microsoft try and explain this. Still, credit where credit's due, energy saving mode is definitely a lot cheaper than regular standby mode, though it certainly wasn't 20 times cheaper as apparently Microsoft claims when the One X was sat there doing nothing. Though, I guess the biggest difference will be when it's downloading updates, where energy saver mode was about 18 and a half times cheaper than standby. But either way, it's still a massive saving over the course of a year. And let's not forget the One X's power off option hidden away in the menus. How does that measure up? Well, from what I can tell, it's no different to energy saving mode, lapping up 0.002 kilowatt hours again. Over the course of a year, that would also cost us six quid in total. Now, for the longest time, I'd been keeping my One X in standby mode so that it would download game and system updates in the background. Energy Saver didn't offer this when I first got the system. However, earlier this year, Microsoft pushed out an update to let Energy Saving Mode do exactly that. So, uh, since I have no use for the One X's remote play capability, and I'm patient enough to let it take a little longer to boot up, Energy Saver is now a much more attractive option. Despite it not living up to Microsoft's claims, I urge you all to switch over to it immediately. Rip and tear until it is done. Now, as beefy as the One X is, it doesn't come close to the Series X, the first of the latest generation of systems. With everything ramped up beyond 11, what will this 9th gen console cost us to run? I'm pretty sure many of you are eagerly awaiting the result. Similar to the One X, the best way for me to measure the Series X's power draw would be to run a game optimised for the platform. I went with Doom Eternal with ray tracing enabled to try and obtain a more accurate top end reading. After an hour of slaying demons, I got a reading of 0.152 kilowatt hours, which is only slightly more than what I got from the One X. This works out again as a little over five pence per hour and would overall be one pound 24 if Doom Guy decided to go on a 24 hour rampage, which, okay, that's fair enough given that the fate of the earth is at hand. Now the Series X has the same standby options as the One X, regular standby and energy saving mode again, except both have the benefit this time of supporting quick resume. Now I've left this feature enabled for the following measurements and I'll explain why in a minute. In standby, not downloading anything, I was expecting a power draw similar to or higher than the One X, but I was absolutely staggered when, in fact, it was half as much at 0.008 kilowatt hours. That's quarter of a pence per hour, and it works out at nearly 24 pounds per year. That's a damn sight better than what the One X was giving me. This quickly changed when I left it in standby, re-downloading the Matrix Tech demo, 
where it sucked up 0.026 kilowatt hours over the span of 60 minutes. That's a little under a penny an hour and over 21 pence per day. I suppose that is still better than the 1X, that's a step in the right direction there. Now I approached the Series X's energy saver mode with a degree of scepticism, given what I was finding with the 1X. But I was, once again, surprised at what I found. Zero. Absolutely nothing. This definitely didn't seem in line with what Microsoft were claiming. I mean, maybe half a watt is less than what this power meter can measure. So I decided to leave it connected and not use the Series X for two days straight to see what comes out of it. Over the course of 48 hours, the Series X in energy saving mode had used up a little over half an hour of measurable power, which totaled 0.035 kilowatt hours. That's a little over half a pence a day and a smidge more than two pounds every year. Of course, this will depend on what updates are available for your Series X, but given I've got over 300 games on here and this is all it cost over two days, that's bloody impressive. Now, all of these kilowatt hours were measured with Doom Eternal in Quick Resume. So to try to be fair, I at least measured standby mode again with the Quick Resume turned off for it. The result was a mere 0.001 kilowatt hour difference after an hour. And even this crept up to 0.008 kilowatt hours only a few seconds into the next hour. So having a game in Quick Resume really only made like a negligible difference, if any. Now, given this is a current gen system with game and system updates galore, I would strongly recommend going with energy saving mode. Given you'd be making at least a £24 saving over the course of a year, I'm sure you can live without that fast boot. The very last system I have set up is also one of the funkiest looking, the beefcake that is the PlayStation 5. This has many of the same power options as the PS4 Pro, and we know how complicated that was, so let's not waste any time and get right into covering them all. I tested the in-use power draw of the PS5 running Gran Turismo 7, like I did with the PS4 Pro, with a mixture of 60 frames per second racing and 30 frames per second replays with ray tracing enabled. The end result was absolutely incredible, at over 0.2 kilowatt hours. That's nearly touching seven pence an hour. This makes taking part in one of those 24 hour endurance races cost the most it ever has, at one pound 66 per day. So yeah, we know what we're gonna do. As I've already said, the standby options are pretty much the same for the PS5 as they are for the Pro with the only notable exception being the application suspension option, which is entirely vacant. I had my PS5 configured in rest mode, similar to what I had on my PS4. So let's see the draw of my typical setup when not in use. Unbelievably, the PS5 drew 0.002 kilowatt hours, which is a third of what the PS4 Pro was drawing. That works out as 0.07 pence an hour and a little under six quid per year. Of course, this will fluctuate when there's an update downloading, but for the vast majority of the time, it's gotta remain this low. And speaking of downloading in rest mode, whilst downloading the Final Fantasy VII Remake, it was sucking up 0.045 kilowatt hours. So that's in the region of one and a half pence per hour and just under 37 pence per day. Let's just hope your internet connection is up to snuff, else downloading games are gonna cost you more than you think this might be a good time to invest in extra storage. Back to the other rest mode options, I found they actually didn't differ at all in their power draw for the most part. Over the course of a year, they may start diverging, but at least in the tests that I did, the power draw difference between them was trivial. The two settings where I did see a difference was when the PS5 was only set to be connected to the internet and with everything turned off entirely, which you might remember the PS4 Pro didn't let us do. Both of these drew absolutely nothing from the mains. Now, of course, staying connected to the internet would mean its power draw would still fluctuate when updates are available, but it's nice to see that it otherwise draws nothing. And finally, we come to the PS5's off mode where, well, <laughs> unsurprisingly, it draws nothing from the mains as well. So, when it comes to power managing your PS5, as it's a current generation system, it's gonna be entirely down to you what to do. It doesn't seem to draw much power when in rest mode, even when still providing power to the USB ports, which 
many of you may be using to your advantage to charge the DualSense controllers. In my case, I'm going to leave it in my preferred setup. It's drawing so little already that it's comparable to even the Xbox One X's energy saving mode. And if push came to shove, there's always that off option that I can use at any time. All right, so by making all the changes that I've suggested, given how I've had these 8th and 9th gens consoles set up all this time, I stand to save a staggering 81 quid per year on my electricity bills by simply adjusting the power settings for some and turning some of the others off. Believe it or not though, that's not everything. I mean, sure, that's everything I have set up here where I can make some immediate savings, but there are other console variations we need to check out as well. I mean, what if you've got a PS4 instead of a PS4 Pro? Or maybe you've got an Xbox One S instead of a One X? In the next video in the series, I'll be checking how much power is drawn by all of the different console variations that I have. Now that's going to take a while, so it won't be the next video. So be sure to subscribe to be notified when that video does go up. But with that, I'm going to head off because, well, I've got a lot of digging around in my video game collection to do, haven't I? Uh, still, thanks very much for watching. Please leave a like if you like the video. And I'll catch you all next time.